sure I'm saying it right, Asha? That's perfect. Okay, fine. Johansson yes. is in Florence, Italy. She is actually from Stockholm, Sweden. And we're going to talk today about her work history and her brand of Italian wine. So let's just start really quickly with the Time to Wine broadcast. The Time to Wine broadcast features experts in wine, social media, marketing, and leadership in its 9 a.m. Pacific time on the second and fourth Monday of the month. The international second, all of my broadcasts are pretty international. The international broadcast um, that it is on Friday is pre-recorded and posted every Friday at 11 a.m. Both broadcasts are featured on Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And we're also, I was approved for LinkedIn Live. We are going live on LinkedIn Live, YouTube Live, and Facebook Live on a regular basis. And right now, we are going to talk to Asha Johansson in Florence, Italy. She writes about wine and travel for Swedish and Norwegian papers. She is the, the host of, a, of Sweden's first podcast about Italian wine and owns her own olive oil brand, La Colina Blue. So we'll start with her work history, and she's done a lot of work with Italian wine, and we'll talk about that too. So would you tell us a little bit about your work history and your work with Decanter? Yeah, so um, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm very happy to, to join you today. You're so um, welcome. Uh, well, I came to Italy uh, from Stockholm 20 years ago and um, to study political science. So I studied for, for four years and my idea was to uh, become a journalist, but um, to write about politics or um, yeah, that side of, of, of journalism. Um, then during the summers, I worked in a wine bar in Florence. And I guess they hired me because I was blonde and didn't look too bad. I hate to say it, but that's how it works in, in <laughs> Italy sometimes. Uh, and I didn't know anything about uh, wine, um, but I like to study. So I started to study just to be able to know something about what I was um, selling. Um, and that's how I got into wine. Um, I started to study uh, after university. I got... Um, my first assignment um, as a travel guide on wine tours to Italy. Um, so I traveled back and forth uh, in Italy for, for several years. So I kind of learned um, on the ground. And then on the side, I, I tried to, to, to contact newspapers. I really wanted to start writing. That was always um, my dream. Um, and I, I, I don't know if you see it, but my nose is kind of uh, flat. I don't know if you say that in English, but be because all the doors I, you know, that was closed in my face when I tried to contact newspapers and magazines, and it was just no, 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 no in the beginning. Um, and then finally, I got the possibility to start writing for a Swedish magazine, and that's where it all started. And now I work with, um, yeah, the the most influential wine magazines in Sweden, Norway. I write for Canada and the latest one is Decanter. So I kind of worked my way up uh, slowly, but uh, it worked you, while studying you, and doing other things. Do you write about Italian wine? Is that what you were writing about? Yes, uh, I'm specialized on Italian wine. Um, so that's my, my, my focus. Um, and I also teach Italian wine at the Swedish School of Sommelier in Stockholm. Um, One thing I like about what you're saying, especially for entrepreneurs, there are so many people, you know, some of us that move ahead and do the things we want to do have a lot of negativity and resistance while we're doing it, like you were saying, continual no's. But one thing that I see there is you just kept pushing through. And didn't let that stop you. And and that's one thing I, I see in successful entrepreneurs and people is that being able to like um, J.K. Rowling that with Harry Potter that was continually rejected for her books is kind of interesting. That's what I see there. <laughs> yeah, no, I had, I, th that's really what I wanted to do. It was my dream as a, as a child to be able to write and to tell stories. Um, so yes, I kind of pushed through and, uh, there's one editor in chief, um, that I still work with since several years. And she said, I just gave you the possibility because I couldn't see your emails anymore in the inbox. They were like all over the place. 
um so i guess that that worked in the end then um yeah um you kind of have to get up when you get a no you just have to get up i remember one once I got a possibility to write for a, a big um, food magazine in Sweden and I had to collaborate with a, a photographer and I didn't know much about photography and the photographs weren't good enough so the work wasn't published. Um, and she said, I'm, I'm really sorry, but the, the, the photos won't work. So I'm really sorry, but I can't publish your work. Um, and of course, I was really sad. I saw it as a big chance to get um, into um, the, the the Swedish um, uh, like this very important magazine, but after that I was like, okay, get on with it. And I took a course in photography during a whole year, not to become a photographer, but to understand what was good photography. So now I work with some very very talented photographers. Um, so I, I I guess it's not about falling; it's how to how you get up. Oh, I think that's wonderful. So do you want to talk a little bit about your Italian wine podcast? It's Italian Podden. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. I love, you. I love your tell Swedish me. pronunciation. It's great. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, tell me, uh, tell me about your podcast and what you do. I looked at it and I believe it was in Italian, so I couldn't understand everything. But tell, but tell me what, what you're doing with that and how that's going. Yeah, so it, it, this is a project that I um, created with a very good friend of mine, uh, Daniel Jonsson. And he's, um, he takes care of all the technical part. He works with Swedish television and, and, and so on. So he takes care of the music and, um, and everything that is technical. Um, it was born out of pure passion. Um, I wanted to tell the stories uh, that very often don't get... Um, a place in magazines there's no room for many very often there's not enough room for 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 stories in in magazines so I wanted to create another channel to tell those stories so it was born out of pure passion um, I interview um, wine people uh, similar to 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 what you do uh, producers uh, journalists um, anyone connected to to the wine industry um, the intro is in Swedish and normally the interviews are in English. Um, and it's the first podcast about Italian wine in, in Sweden. It's been a great success. We didn't expect that, but um, we're growing for every episode. So we're very happy about that. How do, how do people find you if they want to uh, listen? We're on like all places where you can find podcasts like Acast, Spotify, um, like the regular places for for podcasts. Okay. And this, you know, this same thing, I started this, when I started this, it wasn't a live broadcast like this. I actually, when I started working at the university, I started the wine program the, in, in social media program. So I'm an entrepreneur and I started the first collegiate social media club. So I came out and I started inventing this but it started with two pictures. So I might have your picture and my picture and saying we're doing a live broadcast. <laughs> and then we mm -hmm. then I started doing it with graphics. So then I went from and so now I have three and that one's still very popular because I ask you on the other one, I go into the industry and I ask you very specific questions about Italian wine and then you answer it on Twitter. So it's not in a video format. It's in a graphic format, but it goes all over the world. So I, I've been, I started that and then I started doing this and everyone went crazy. <laughs> when I started, they were like, woo. Okay. So let's talk about the Italian wine market in Sweden. Yeah. Oh, the, you know, the Swedish market is kind of particular, or it is particular uh, because we have the state monopoly. Um, so in Sweden, the only way to buy wine um, is through uh, the Monopoly stores. The Monopoly has around 400 stores all over um, Sweden. So that's the only place where you can buy wine. Um, then the importers can sell directly to, to restaurants or uh, to hotels and so on. But for private people, you have to go to the Monopoly store. So it's very, it very much depends on what is sold there, um, how the market uh, develops. So it, it is a particular place for wine, like like um, Canada or or the other Scandinavian countries. Um, 
Um, but Italian wines are doing really well. Uh, Italian wines has around 30% of the total market and uh, up to 40% when it comes to red wine. So Swedish, um, Swedish people love everything that is Italian sounding, uh, Italian food, Italian way of life, and also Italian, Italian wine. Um, in the past, it was, um, or some years ago, it was Veneto that was the most uh, popular region with Amarone and uh, Ripasso. And now Piedmont is growing and also Sicily um, is becoming stronger. So it's a great interest towards Italian wine. And that sounds so interesting. I'd love to go to Stockholm and I'd love to see Sweden. I've been to Italy and Germany and I've been all over um, Europe, but I haven't been to Sweden and I'd love to visit. Oh, let me know when you come. I would take I'd you love, on a food, I'd love to food visit. tour. Okay. <laughs> yes. So, okay. Now we talked a little bit about this, but I know you said you're traveling a hundred days out of the year. So are you traveling for wine and um, I know you write about wine and travel. Is that what, are you writing for a variety of different magazines or are you writing predominantly in Sweden and Norwegian magazines? Yeah, uh, mostly Sweden and, uh, and Norway, but also a little bit in Italy. And I work with Quench magazine in, in Canada and well, uh, lately decanter in, 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 in England. Um, but I travel uh, for the press assignments, but also uh, for wine tours because I work with um, the specialized wine tour agency called BK Wine. And we uh, I'm in charge of the Italian market for them. So we organize wine tours, specialized wine tours all over um, Italy. So between them and the press assignments, I travel yeah, more or less 100 days a year. Um, but it's really funny when someone asks my 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 youngest son, like, what does your mother work with? He's like, she goes by train and she drinks wine. So uh, that's <laughs> <laughs> more or less how you could describe my life, maybe. <laughs> she does something. I think I was doing that for, I st I'm still, I was on tr a lot of trains for a while. Okay, so let's talk about your wine trips to Italy. Do you want to go in a little bit of detail about that? Yeah, no, I love the wine tours because it's, um, it makes you um, stay in contact with uh, the ones actually drinking the wines. Because I think one of the problems with wine writing is that um, sometimes we tend to talk to each other instead of talking to the ones actually buying and drinking um, the wines. So I, I, for me, it's, um, it's really important to stay in contact um with wine lovers um to see what they're interested in how they talk about wine and and uh what they what they look for um and i i see that it has been a great change in the last 10 years i think um today um the people or the persons that travel with me they have a great knowledge um many of them take courses they they study um, so they're very curious wine lovers and uh, they look for more um, genuine experience experiences than, than before, I think. Um, they have traveled a lot, um, so they really want to meet the people behind the wine uh, to have a genuine experience. It's very often more appreciated to eat um, a very simple um, uh, meal with a, a a, a local wine producer than to have a, I don't know, a very fancy dinner in a Michelin star um, restaurant, for example. So I think um, the persons that travel now, they're really looking for a genuine experience and to learn, um, to gain knowledge. That's what I see. Um, so those are really fun trips. Um, and uh, I get to choose all the producers. So I, I, I can decide where to go and who to meet um, and I'm always curious so I always try to find new places every trip so it's never never the same not even for me um, I always go well of course I go back to the ones that um, I, I, I enjoy the most uh, uh, but um, it's a great way for me too to experience Italy and to stay in contact and understand what is happening in, in the wine world in, in Italy. What I found when I, so I was taking 21, 20 and 21 year olds to Italy. And what I'm finding 
when I talk to people about this is there's all different types of groups that are interested. There's people that are heavily involved in wine that are interested. There are people that know nothing about wine that are interested that would love like anyone else to go try uh, Chianti in the rolling hills of Tuscany um, with no experience whatsoever. And then I found that there were a lot of business people, the same thing. Um, I've had uh, many universities tell me they would like me to continue doing that. We kind of had have had COVID in the middle of all of this, but I've had a lot of universities saying, would you take our students to Italy on wine tours? And then I've had business people asking me to take people on wine tours. And then, you know, also like I was saying, people that have no experience with wine whatsoever. So there's been kind of a different demographic for people that would really like to do that. So we'll keep talking about that. <laughs> yeah, okay. no, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's really interesting. And I also feel, because for a while I thought, oh, well, doing tours, it can make, does it, you know, give a, um, how do you say in English? It, it doesn't um, make sense. You know, it's not an, as, as important um, as, I don't know, being a doctor or, or something else. But in the end, those, trips or journeys for many people are so important they're very often um maybe a couple celebrating uh, something or someone has been saving money for a long time and um they i don't know it, it's really it, it it connects you to to other persons that's for sure and with many of them i stay in contact afterwards and you know you become friends for for life almost, because traveling together uh, for I don't know, almost a week, um, you know, staying together, it's, uh, no, I, I really enjoy it. I really enjoy it to share all of, you know, the, the, the beautiful and nuanced Italian wine world with other persons. It's fantastic. And are most of your tours, are they usually a week or do you have different durations? Uh, normally we do Wednesday to Sunday and we visit three wineries a day with lunch and then the evening is off so um, we normally stay in a small town or a, maybe a bigger city um, but the evenings are are free so everyone can walk out and um, take their time eat something if they're still hungry normally normally you know in Italy there's a lot of a lot of food during the day um, so we stay together during the day and then in the evenings uh, you're free to do your own thing. That's, uh, that sounds wonderful. I'd love to see the wineries. I on my LinkedIn page, you can also look at the wineries I was working at too. So because I I, worked, I always check it out. I worked with we worked with fifteen different Italian wineries, and so I have them posted on LinkedIn. But I can't remember all of them. But um, but we can talk. I'll, I'll tell you which ones I worked with. Okay, so COVID has been a surprise to all of us. Did we ever know? And, and, and actually in the beginning, um, we're going through a global pandemic. Didn't set well <laughs> with all of us. So I think that, um, so I'd love to hear your experience over here when that first started, when they were saying you need to I don't, it was just so scary in the beginning. You need to go home. You, you can't be around your family and you need to separate from everybody. It was just the, the strangest science fiction film I'd ever been in. So what was your experience on your side? Oh, um, in the, in the, uh, at the beginning, I couldn't believe what was happening. And I admit that for the first two weeks of complete lockdown, because we were in complete lockdown for three months in Italy, so we couldn't leave our homes expect, uh, except for grocery shopping or to go to the pharmacy. We are lucky because we have a garden and uh, so we could still stay outside. But for the first two weeks, when I saw all my work, everything just disappeared, all uh, everything I programmed and worked for and my calendar was suddenly completely empty. I was totally devastated. It felt like I was losing everything I worked for. Um, but then after two weeks, um, I um, put myself together um, and I said, okay, so if we're gonna do this, um, you have to be flexible and adapt um so i i um called all the newspapers that i work with and they transformed 
the jobs that I um, that they had assigned to me into something else that I could could do from from home. Um, I studied a lot uh, during during the time, um, but I can see now that during the three months where when um, during which we couldn't go out, um, it you know we we all feel it still. It's um, it was a hard experience. But, you know, someone takes away your freedom and we're so, or I was so used and I think we all were so used of being free and not having freedom was for me, maybe the most difficult part. Um, but at the same time, I think that I re-evaluated some, some things. I um, understood the importance of family and, and friends and kind of rethought what was really important in life and also the importance of time. Um, I was, you know, always traveling, always on the road um, and so on, but it's also important to spend time with the persons that are important to you. So I think in many ways it has been positive for me as a person, um, but still difficult to accept that it never ends <laughs> because yeah. I like to plan things too. So um, I, I hope it ends soon. Um, um, and I, I, I just, you know, I, I am one of the lucky ones. I have been able to work the whole time, but there's so many persons in difficulty and so many persons, families, they have seen their businesses just disappear and, um it's kind of devastating to see that uh, around you. It is. And what I'm seeing over here is that, so we're all still, we're wearing masks. So we're wearing masks at work and we're wearing masks out in public to any public places. The, the masks are mandated. We're, we're out and about so we can work and we um, can be out. The, the only thing that seems, and, and I'll say some of the silver linings over here with myself is I'm an extrovert and I'm always out also. And so being at home, I did a lot of, I, I interest, you know, it was strange. I started all of this work I was doing on social media because I was at home, but things like cleaning out your closets and organizing mm -hmm. photos in the closet that I would have never done. And I was pulling out photos of people from 30 years ago and posting them on Facebook, which was really entertaining. And at that point, mm -hmm. I don't know if we knew we were all going to live. <laughs> so, I just wanted to let you know I really cared about you <laughs> and I think that all of the what I saw was a lot of home projects a lot of families at home painting uh working on the driveways doing painting inside the house um there were a lot of really nice things uh parents at home with their children and a lot of people that had um had jobs where they were driving two hours to work, they were working from home. So they had four more hours to be at home. And a lot of them, some of the transitions was they didn't want to do that anymore. So I'd like to work at home where my family, you know, I don't want to spend four hours a day driving to work. So there was just a lot of transitions that I thought were actually quite lovely um, yeah, on, no, on this side too. Yeah, no, it's for innovation. A, a, Exactly, and it's a kind of a large experience, social experiment on, long, on yes. a large scale. Yes, um, and we're still. We gone through. I, I'm uh, working at a concert hall, and they're requiring a COVID card and a driver's license. And when you come in the door, and you know, people people are showing up. They can't get in if they don't have their COVID vaccinations. And so, I said, you know. I think this is going to be something that we're going to have to do, you know, for, for a good while is to bring that card with you. So don't forget to bring your card. Okay. So let's talk about your olive oil company. It's La uh, Colina Blue. Yes, it's La Colina Blue, uh, the Blue Hill in Italian. It's a, it's a very small project uh, with, a, with a big heart. Um, it's, um, it's, uh, it's something that I do with my husband, Stefano, because Stefano, uh, he builds, uh, he's an engineer, so he builds olive oil machines. 
so he's actually the real olive oil nerd of the family like it's it's really bad and when we have guests like the kids walk up to the guests and they say like don't ask daddy about the olive oil he won't stop talking it's <laughs> uh, it's uh so we started together we have um olive trees and it's um in, in until two years ago we ate it all by ourselves and then we said why well, we should bottle some and like make a label and um try to 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 share it and and make other people taste it we really enjoyed it um and the name la colina blue means the blue hill um because we live on a tuscan you know the typical tuscan hill with cypress trees and olive trees and 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 vineyards surrounded by vineyards is really really ugly place <laughs> yeah no, it sounds I mean, it sounds awful <laughs> it's horrible yeah it's awful it's awful um but during a at a certain time in the evening it's um a particular blue light you know as photographers call the, the the blue hour um um and it's just amazingly beautiful um but it's also a tribute to um the northern suburb of stockholm where i grew up um, it's a quite difficult suburb and it's called the Blue Hill. And um, I wanted to give a tribute to the kids that grow up there that start out with very little and they give back very much just as, uh, just like olive trees in, in a way. So that's kind of the philosophy be behind the name. Um, it's a very small production, very t classical Tuscan uh, fresh uh, cut grass and like a peppery tone um, to it, um, but we 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 sell it in Sweden and, and and to friends. But it's very 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 small, very small. It's pure passion even there. Uh, it's not you 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 never get you you don't make any money with olive oil. It's just pure passion. So we want to contribute to the old historical tradition of really high quality olive oil because um, there's so much fake products out there. It's actually very difficult to get a high quality olive oil. So we try to support other local producers that might not speak you know, English or uh, get out on other markets. So we, we, we try to, to create network with, with them and to, to um, promote the product and not our brand. That's how I. Where do you it. where do you sell the olive oil? Do you sell it in the market, or do you do you sell it um, somewhere else? Um, we sell it in Sweden. Oh, okay, um, in Sweden. Yeah, in specialized stores, and um, there's one very well known pizzeria in Sweden that fell in love with olive oil, and they buy kind of half of the production. I don't know how that oh, cool. happened, but it happened. Yeah, so you know, just. Yeah, but most in, in Sweden and to friends around the world that know about us and, you know, that order uh, six bottles for the year or something like that. But yeah, it, it, it's fun also to do something with um, with Stefano, uh, to do something together uh, within the family. Um, as long as I remain the boss, everything is, is fine. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that would be lovely, too. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, okay, during your travels and working with people from different cultures, what are some, and even you moving from one culture to another, what would you say some of your top culture shock stories are? Ooh, oh, there's so many. Uh, all the mistakes you make in a foreign country. Um, every day I still make mistakes. Um Coming as a Swede to Italy, um, it's, you know, Swedes, we learn to follow the group, uh, you follow the rules, uh, you don't think a lot by yourself, uh, you shouldn't stand out, you should never, um, you know, think you're good or that you're uh, something special, you could keep a very low tone, low voice, um, that's kind of what they teach you in, in Sweden. So you can just imagine how it is coming to Italy where it's more or less the opposite. So I remember um, in, in the beginning, I couldn't even order a coffee at the bar because I was standing in line, you know, and uh, it took some time, you know, to learn how to use your elbows to get, you know, to, to the barman and get your espresso. Um, but also, um, 
I also learned how it feels to be different, uh, not to be in control, uh, to make mistakes, um, to feel embarrassed, uh, not to be in control of the situation. You know, all those fears that we have socially, um, I, I experienced those. And it, um, for me, it has been um, a great journey um, personally um to to yeah to experience that and um, understand that it's okay anyway and that you you, you that i managed uh, um anyway um and yeah um but I, I continue to make mistakes you know my my kids they correct my italian all the time and um there's some really funny uh, weird mistakes i've made um uh, you know, during during work, uh, very embarrassing. Um, you know, when people around you start to say, "No, she didn't mean that. She's from Sweden." And I was like, "Oh, okay, then it's okay." Um, <laughs> but, but yeah. Um, so, what about you? Uh, culture shock. Well, I have a Brazilian husband, so I've mm. I've been to Brazil fifteen times, and I've been to Italy about thirteen times. So I have some in Italy. And I have many in Brazil. <laughs> so um, a couple between a couple that are between the two countries is, you know, in Italy, there's a lot of talking with the hand. And I can't remember exactly, but I believe in Italy, they'll, you know, especially if you're I don't I can speak in I could speak enough Italian to get around and I would stay in cities that there was only Italian spoken but I'm certainly not you know I could someone said where are you from what do you do why are you here I could answer all of those questions um but I think if they're saying do you like the food I, from my memory it was like yes mm -hmm. and in or in this in Brazil is a very offensive gesture <laughs> so so whatever I, I think it was that that I was doing in Italy going yes love yeah. so I got to Brazil and someone my husband was like why are you doing that <laughs> <laughs> that that it it it's very offensive and one doesn't do that <laughs> in polite society oh, so, I so mm -hmm. things I didn't know and then there are um my entire family in Brazil and extended family, they all have cosmetic surgery. So I always worry because I show up and I'm the only one that doesn't have cosmetic surgery. <laughs> and so I show up and so, so, so there's like 15 people and they all have cosmetic surgery. So there's people that are 30 years older than me that look younger than me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so they they um so I am always like oh you know what I wonder if I should just get some cosmetic surgery <laughs> so, but I what happens or what happened for a long time is I was always and then they always have on tropical dresses they have mm -hmm. um Brazilian their hair is Brazil very different uh traditionally long dark hair and so I would show up with and then their summer is in my winter so I'm trying to find a dress and the only thing available is black so I'm trying <laughs> to find something to wear I've got my haircut and I don't have cosmetic surgery so I show up and I am always expecting it to feel really awkward and out of place and they <laughs> always love my hair they always love my dress whatever it is I'm doing is so much more interesting than this tropical dress that I think is fabulous and so is and um there's oh your hair is like Victoria Beckham and just you know there's always something something nice and but there are some pulling at my face and my eyes <laughs> you'd look beautiful That's with hilarious and apparently in Brazil, I don't know about other countries, Brazil, cosmetic surgery is covered by insurance. So if you go to the oh, doctor wow. and you're feeling a little upset because, you know, you've got some wrinkles here or there mm -hmm. and you're depressed, gosh, darn it, they'll fix that for you. And you <laughs> <laughs> they, they um, it's covered by insurance and you'll feel better 
after they correct all of this for you and they <laughs> yeah, it's just it's kind of an interesting cult- culture shock <laughs> Um, oh, oh uh, yes. Another, <laughs> here's another culture shock I'll share with you. So, and it made me think, what was I doing in the United States? When I had a baby, I was, and it sounds like you, I was at home, I was working and then I was taking care of the baby 24 hours a day. Um, a lot of Brazilians have nannies that take care of the babies in the evening and during the day. So, mm-hmm. um, my sister-in-law has a new baby and she has a nanny that comes in all day and a nanny that comes in all night. And I was like, "Woo, that sounds like (laughs) my version of heaven with a new infant. So um, now you, you've been sharing this all along. You're an entrepreneur. And what I see in you is you push through all kinds of things. You've continually (laughs) pushed through This isn't working out for me. So I'm going to find a way and push through. And I love hearing these stories. So particularly about pushing through to become a writer, pushing through taking photography classes, you're still pushing through. I'm going to now have a company that's an olive oil company. So what are some of your tips for entrepreneurs? Honestly, Jessica, I I I'm not sure I'm the right person to give advice to, to others. <laughs> well, I'm I still trying to, to to figure <laughs> it out. Actually, um, um, I I think th- th- for me, uh, I work well when um, when I'm positive about things and when I really enjoy what I'm doing. I guess I have a strong belief, and I'm kind of stubborn. And I don't like to fail. Uh, um, so I, I, I guess I'm, I, I try to push through as, as much as I, as I, as I can. And um, yeah, what I try to listen to those who know more than, than me. Um, I try to be creative and try to find solutions even when I don't see them. Um, but I, 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 you know, I navigate without the map. That's how, how I feel. Um, but I, what I love about all of this is that I continue to learn um, and to meet new, uh, new persons. And uh, yeah, and, and I'm able to live of what I'm doing. And that's enough um, for me. Um, so I, I, I don't think I'm the right person to, to, to give advice. I guess I don't know. Um, you just have to believe and try and get up when you fall. I don't know. <laughs> what do you say? Well, I think I think some of that is like you said, is your culture. Because what I hear on my side is perseverance. You push through and you keep going and you don't let anything stop you. And it's just fabulous to hear. And you had a, a story um that you were talking about on LinkedIn about, you want to talk a little bit about some of your wishes and dreams and being home with the babies real quick. Yeah. So yeah, we, we, uh, I, um, when I I had my second child, I was at home. I took care of the kids and um, there was uh, not enough help from grandparents. Uh, It was just me and my husband, uh, not an, you know, very difficult to, to get, um, Uh, daycare uh, for for kids in Italy too Um, so I when I was really tired I felt I was completely stuck Um, I had just opened my little company but I was really really in the beginning and I felt I was going nowhere so I just sat on the floor uh, with the babies crawling all over the place and wrote down what I was dreaming of and um, I always wanted to write so that was number one um, travel, love travel, uh, study. Uh, I could stay in university forever. It's a pity you can't stay in university forever. I would have loved that. Um, I wanted to to study um, and then go go home to Sweden during the summers with with the children. And then I just added a little note at the end, and I said, and then I want to write an article for Decanter, and that felt like I was writing. I want to go to the moon and meet Elon. <laughs> Musk or, or something else, um, but um, in, in yeah, no, that list is 
you know, I checked all those points now. Um, so I'm very glad. But there is many there there are many other lists going on. So that's just one of the lists. My next my next project is to learn how to make honey. I want to understand the perfect society and learn more about bees and I want to start to make honey my husband is already very concerned <laughs> because he thinks all my projects are enough um so maybe jessica next time we can talk about honey and bees and beehives we can and my husband works with honey and a lot ah. of he works for a big company here that imports honey and a lot of honey is imported from brazil so we'll chat when we're finished <laughs> Oh, about, wow. about some you? connections here. So he actually, he works for a, a big company and they have, they import um, honey from South America. So he was in South America at the, the beehives oh, there. Wow. No, so he, it. he can see? talk to huh. you. So I have a connection with the honey. So I, in fact, I have a lot of honey in my house. So we'll chat, <laughs> we'll chat about the honey. Okay. Yeah. Let's go ahead. And, um, We'll end the broadcast and then we'll keep talking when we're finished. Okay. So thank you so much. And what I'm working on right now is having an editor that can edit sound bites from the videos and edit out anything that we need to have edited out. But this will be airing on a Friday at 11 and I believe in January and I'll send you the date for that. And thank you thank so you. much from t for talking to me from Tuscany, Italy. And I like hearing more about Sweden. So I'll go ahead and we'll end the broadcast. Uh, remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel. The Time to Wine broadcast is every other Monday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we'll be going live as we'll doing international broadcasts. Thank you so much.